Welcome to Research Notes by Lucas Engelhardt. In this series, I provide brief comments on research that I've read recently. I make no promises to get everything right and certainly leave a lot out. My hope is that this series will spark your interest so that you look some of these papers up. Today, we'll look at a paper by Nathan Nunn from the American Economic Association's Papers and Proceedings for the 2022 meeting. This paper provided the basis for the AEA Distinguished Lecture that year. The paper's title, On the Dynamics of Human Behavior, the Past, Present, and Future of Culture, Conflict, and Cooperation. We'll consider this paper in three parts. First, the answer to the question, why tradition exists. Second, the empirical implications of tradition. Finally, we'll look at the policy implications of tradition. The paper looks at the idea of tradition from an economist's perspective, so the first question we need to answer is why tradition even arises as a social phenomenon. None suggests that it is a combination of two reasons. First, optimization is costly. That is, figuring out the exactly optimal action in a given situation is hard. It requires a great deal of effort to evaluate all possible options and select the best one. Second, in most cases, change is fairly slow. The implication of this is that it makes sense to copy what previous generations did, since it was obviously good enough to survive, if nothing else. To model the idea of tradition, Nunn proposes a multiple generation model. Each generation is composed of two groups. Some are optimizers who always choose the optimal action and ignore tradition. Others are traditionalists who will randomly choose a person from the previous generation and do whatever they did. If everyone is an optimizer, then everyone immediately changes their action once circumstances change. If everyone is a traditionalist, then no one ever changes their action, no matter how suboptimal it is. Of course, in reality, neither of these will happen. We'll have a mix of the two. This mix gives rise to three phenomena. To highlight these, let's say that for a long time, action A was optimal, but then a change happens so that action B is now optimal. We want to think about what we'll find in society after this change in circumstances. The first implication is persistence. While the optimizers immediately adopt action B, the traditionalists won't, at least not in the first generation after the change. Over time, though, the new action will spread, as some traditionalists in the next generation will be copying optimizers from the previous generation. However, it takes a very long time for the newly optimal choice to become widespread. For example, if 80% of society are traditionalists, then after three generations pass, we still have about half of society following the old action that is now outdated. A second implication is mismatch, which follows immediately from persistence. That is, there will be a mismatch between what is optimal and what some people actually do. This is because of the persistence of the old action. The third implication is disagreement. That is, when the optimal action changes, we'll see significant disagreement between people in terms of what action they want to follow. Importantly, after the first generation, the debate isn't just between optimizers and traditionalists. Instead, it's largely between traditionalists who are copying those who followed the old ways and traditionalists who are copying those who are following the new ways. Because traditionalism is often given moral weight, the debates between these two sets of traditionalists can be particularly nasty, and interestingly, reach their maximum intensity a few generations after the initiating change occurs. There are two main implications for policy. First is that policy may be successful at reducing mismatch if we can identify cases of mismatch. For example, this is often the case with immigrants who move between countries with radically different economies. For example, immigrants that move from a poor country where education has very low return on investment to a wealthier country where education has a very high return on investment. In this case, tradition would lead to families undervaluing education. However, policies that inform immigrants in, that, in this country, uh, education can lead to much better employment opportunities, have been shown to be successful at changing behavior. Interestingly, these programs have an impact on those who have experienced this kind of cultural change, but not on those who haven't. This is actually quite good, as it tells us that we're not just convincing everyone to pursue more education, but that we're actually helping people correct their misperceptions about the value of education in the particular context in which they find themselves. Second is that policy that imposes changes in actions may create bad outcomes if the circumstances that created the traditions that are being targeted haven't changed. For example, in Africa, traditional grazing practices involve moving herds from one location to another. 
However, several governments thought that this practice was backward and therefore worked to decrease it. However, in the climate of the area, pastoral grazing makes perfect sense. In an area that is not particularly friendly to flora, moving herds around allows herds to feed while minimizing harm to any particular grazing area. Meanwhile, building a ranch in a fixed location would quickly use up the available grazing lands, leading to less food being available. A significant implication of this is that for policy to be successful, it should be targeted to alleviating mismatch. This is often done best by providing information about changes that have occurred in effect making optimization easier. Nunn also gives an interesting example in how black patients in the US are more likely to follow the advice of black doctors, a result of the distrust of the medical establishment arising from racist practices like the Tuskegee experiment. I would interpret this intervention of trying to match black patients with black doctors as a particular form of information sharing, that is sharing information in a way that communicates its trustworthiness. Now a few of my own thoughts. Like many times when economists branch out of traditional economic topics, this felt very much like it was simply taking a fairly obvious observation that some people are optimizers and others simply copy previous generations, and the fairly clear implication that you'll find more tradition in societies where conditions are stable and optimization is hard, and then dressed it up in mathematical language. Very little that was said in this paper was made clearer thanks to the mathematics that was introduced. However, I don't want to criticize the paper too severely, as I think it offers a way for the mainstream of economics to frame important social forces that are too often ignored in our standard models. So while I'm not confident that the content was particularly surprising, I do think it has the potential to be useful in moving economics as a discipline forward in our understanding of social phenomena.